Progressive presents Forced Metaphors about bundling your home and auto. When you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, you get great savings and round-the-clock protection, which is as beautiful as looking your firstborn child in the eyes for the first time. Well, that's a bit much. Maybe it's more like looking your second-born child in the eyes for like the third or fourth time. Point being, the savings and round-the-clock protection are really, really magical. Forced Metaphors, presented by Progressive. Bundle and protect today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome to Jumping Bomb Audio. And welcome back to Jumping Bomb Audio, the world's number one show all about the world of Joshi Pro Wrestling. My name is Taylor, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host. He is the Tokyo Princess of this podcast. It's Kelly. Kelly, wow. how you doing? I'm I'm good. I got a uh, I got a cold, and it's not COVID. And it's like, what's the point? Why am I like this if I don't have the worldwide pandemic again? I think that's going around now that people are getting sick because yeah. now everyone's sort of going back to their life and their bodies are like, no, we spent two years very protected. <laughs> and so now people are just getting boring colds. Yeah. And it's like, but at least like, I don't feel dumb like I did when I had COVID or like, I don't worry about my blood turning to jelly. So that's cool. Yes. It's, it's all in the perspective. Yeah. It's just like, being sick but without the stress of the last time i was sick yeah the stress the guilt the you know the fear yeah uh, all of that stuff but we are here to talk about a lot of joshi pro wrestling we have both tokyo joshi cork and hall shows their fine the semifinals and finals of the tokyo princess cup we have the big stardom show from nagoya that happened Uh, just today as we record, and we're going to be talking all about the five-star Grand Prix. So let's dive right into it. But before we do, the plugs. If you don't follow us yet on Twitter, give us a follow at Audio. You can follow Kelly at Comic E. Kelly, and you can follow me at Tay Mambo. Subscribe to this podcast on your podcast app of choice. And if that app of choice happens to be Apple Podcasts, we'd love to get a five-star rating and review. And if you're feeling extra generous, you can donate to the show at redcircle.com slash shows slash jumping dash bomb dash audio. So the first thing we're going to cover is the two Tokyo Joshi Korokin Hall shows. The first show on August 13th, the semifinals of the Tokyo Princess Cup in front of 444 fans. Starting off, Kelly, overall, what'd you think of the show? I thought it was really good. It was a fun show. Uh, really good top two and solid throughout just the whole card, really. Yeah, I thought this was a really fun show. I thought it was, uh, I guess, spoilers. I thought it was the better of the two shows. Um, and I agree with you. I thought that there was a lot of fun stuff throughout the card, which I think really helped. I think the second night was more uh, top heavy of a card. Yeah. Uh, but let's dive right into it. The first match, a singles match, Shoko Nakajima defeating Kaya Toribami in nine minutes and 23 seconds. Kelly, what were your thoughts on this first match of the two shows? This is not what I was expecting this match to be. It was a lot more slower paced and more submission based than I was expecting. It was it was good. I liked it. Uh, it's cool to see this side of Toribami, who normally just kind of gets like the hot tag and tag team matches and then does a bunch of cool stuff. 
but yeah, uh, and also went longer than I expected. Uh, it, surprising opener. Uh, I went three stars on it. I liked it quite a bit. Uh, I liked it as well. I really liked it. I went three and a half stars. Uh, I thought it was really good. I think it would be interesting to see. Kaya Torabami is sort of interesting in that she has these sort of flashy moves, but yet she, I do agree with you that she doesn't really feel like uh, a sort of quote unquote, I'll just use this high speed wrestler. Like I would be interested to see her against someone uh, maybe a little faster, maybe like a May Saruga, uh, possibly, just to see sort of how she would work. Um, but I thought this was really good. I thought the pace picked up near the end, which I really liked. And I thought Kaya Torbami kept up very well. She did, with, yeah. Uh, you know, a veteran, the champion of the promotion. And I think that Kaya is starting to look more like a complete wrestler as opposed to just someone as you mentioned, who sort of just comes in and has these, you know, three or four moves that it's like, Oh, I can hit these moves, you know, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Um, so a match I really enjoyed and a good, uh, kickoff for, um, the show. The next match was Kelly's favorite tag team, the team of free Wi-Fi, Hikari Noah and now Kakuda defeating the team of Raku and Yuki Aeno in nine minutes and 15 seconds. Kelly, what did you think of this match? I thought this was fun, but at the same time, it felt incredibly long. <laughs> so by the end of it, I was just kind of like, okay, good. I'm glad that's over. <laughs> I only went two and a half on it. It wasn't. I don't know. I was hoping for more. Uh, what about you? I wrote the word fine exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> and I then wrote, I sort of wish that they would have swapped free Wi-Fi and Haruna Neko and Mihiro Kiryu. Now, of course, it turned out that Mihiro Kiryu was specifically in the match for sort of story purposes. But I think, you know, Yuki and free Wi-Fi against the Mocha Saki and Yuki Arai team, I think would have been really fun. Um, it was just a match that I just sort of thought, okay, this is just sort of a baseline, fine match. You know, as we always say, sort of speaks to the level of the, the, the talent now in Tokyo Joshi that this was a match, I think, in past years, if this was, you know, the second match on a Cork and Hall show, you probably would have been like, yeah, if it's any good, that's sort of lucky. Yeah. <laughs> but now I think the sort of expectations are high, especially sandwich in between the opener, which I thought was really good, and the next match coming up, which I also thought was really good. Um, you know, it's just sort of the expectations now are sort of different for this mm -hmm. company. So it was just a match that I didn't think it was particularly bad in any way, but you know, didn't really end up feeling very strongly about it. Yeah. It was, just, it was there. It happened. The third match on the card, a singles match, May Saruga defeating Arisa Endo in 12 minutes and nine seconds. This was one of my favorite matches on the show. I thought it was really good. Uh, obviously, two very talented wrestlers. And I think Endo is showing herself to... I, I wrote in my notes, I wrote, Endo is the real deal. I think she's very good. Uh, I think she showed it here. I think she's shown it in another of uh, other matches. And I think she had a great opponent in May Saruga. I really think May had some interesting offense. And I always... One thing I really like about May Saruga is... There's always a new sort of wrinkle in her offense when she wrestled. It It isn't just someone who says, okay, I've got these 10 moves. I'm going to do these 10 moves. There's always something sort of new, something I haven't seen. I've seen a lot of Mesa Ruga matches, and I feel like I'm always seeing um, – I feel like I'm always seeing something I haven't seen before, maybe something done a little bit differently or gone into in a different way. So I thought this was very good. I went three and three quarters on this match. Wow. Yeah. May is always looking to improve. Like she's one of those wrestlers where it's, she's constantly working on her game. She's constantly adding new stuff and cycling out things that don't work as well, or just she's always working at it. 
Uh, I thought these two looked really good in this match. Uh, I really enjoyed how it kind of started with May underestimating Endo, but by the end she had to like try to rip her arms off to beat her. <laughs> uh, Endo looked really good here. I thought she had a this might be her best like singles match performance. I think maybe it. Eh, actually no. I think I oddly enough liked her match against um, Rika Sakai a little bit more just because that was a fun sprint. But this was really good. Uh, I went three and a half stars on it. Yeah, and I think Endo has developed the ability to... There's a good flow to her matches that I think sometimes that's a thing that rookies have to learn, and it takes them a bit, where it's like, okay, I'm going to do these five moves. Okay, here's move one. And then, uh, okay, here's move two. There's a flow from sort of step one to step two that makes her seem more like a veteran wrestler than she really is yeah um so yeah i thought it was a another great match and another you know another match that was a strong start to the card um the next match was a three-way match with rika tatsumi defeating both hyper masao and mizuki in 10 minutes and eight seconds uh this is your typical classic uh sort of fun middle of the card tokyo joshi match i had a ton of fun i really enjoyed it there's you know the storyline with you know rika liking mizuki and masao uh rika is masao's hero and all of these things that i think came together in a really fun way um the highlight of the match for me well maybe not the highlight but Uh, Rika taking the can of air spray or whatever you call that, spiking it off the apron and it flying into the crowd. (laughs) And I thought, oh, that's going to hit someone. (laughs) Um, But yeah, and then lots of emotions uh, closer to the end. So really that good sort of fun, usual, I mean, Hyper Masao, you sort of expect it, change of pace match. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this was it really just felt like they took these three and it's like, hey, go have fun out there. Do whatever. <laughs> just just have a ten minute match and have fun with it. And it worked. It was a really great time. Uh also went three and a half stars on this one. Uh it just goes to show how much these three can do with essentially a nothing match, you know? It's just like there's you didn't ha- they didn't have to go out there and tear the house down, but it's just like, hey, let's let's just have a fun match. And I think it speaks a lot to the investment that uh, Tokyo Joshi has done with the with a lot of their sort of characters. Yeah, you know, we talk about Tokyo Joshi used to be almost exclusively character driven. It wasn't very in ring, and I think that this sort of keeps up that character. You know, a lot of reason why it's fun is because people can look at this match, see three people, see three very sort of different characters. Um, and I it's think much that... easier to invest in the wrestlers. Yes, and that makes these nothing matches into something. Whereas, like, if it's just okay, this is a uh, strong lady versus fast lady versus other strong lady. Who cares? <laughs> the next match was the debut of Max the Impaler in Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling, and they took on Palm Harajuku and handily defeated Palm in four minutes and 39 seconds. Kelly, I'll let you go first. Uh, I have a lot to say about this match, but I'll let you give your thoughts first. Uh, Palm did her best, and that's all we can really ask for. Um, Really strong debut for the monster. (laughs) I like the character a lot. The crowd uh, and really the crowd and just based on what we've seen on twitter the roster really seems to love max like they got over really well so i think this match while not being like an in-ring classic or uh, at all this was a huge success uh i went three stars but like in terms of executing what it went out to do it's like a five star you know what i mean uh, yes, because I love this match. I thought it was perfectly done. I thought that there were sort of the elements of comedy in it, but it didn't veer into 
it, it was funny, but not so funny that you're sort of just like, oh, this is a comedy match. It's funny because it's ridiculous to see Palm in there with this Mad Max monster. <laughs> yes. And I laughed at um, Palm trying to leave and Raku being like, nope, you got you yeah. have to finish the <laughs> match. You have to get back in. Like, that was funny. But Palm, I think, was the perfect opponent for this. She had such great facial expressions the whole match um, and was sort of the size of opponent where Max could throw Palm sort of around the ring at will. Um, I thought this was perfect. You know, it's a sub five minute match. I went four stars. I just thought it was perfectly booked. I thought it was such a great debut, but the match was a lot of fun. It made me, it, it was a great debut for Max, but it also made me like Palm more, which is yeah. really the ideal way to sort of do this, where I ended the match thinking, oh, you know, what a great job by Palm, while also being like, oh, what a great debut uh, as well. So, you know, sub five minutes, you can't really put a lot into it. But I thought it was sort of that perfect, you know, you see so many of this, like, oh, I'm a huge, big monster um, beating someone up. And I thought this was sort of the perfect form of that and had some fun twists on the usual formula. So uh, I loved it. Yeah, I feel like I've seen a decent amount of Max the Impaler over the past couple of years, just in the American Indies and stuff. I think this is the best they've ever looked. It also is such a, I think the character sort of in America, I think there's a lot of that sort of character of not specifically, you know, sort of the Mad Max character, but sort of darker characters. Yeah. Of like, oh, you know, you think of, you know, even amongst the men in AEW, like, house of black or things like that sort of these dark characters that you're like oh it's another sort of like that in tokyo joshi there's now no one like that really except for um neo bashiki goon everyone else is sort of very you know yay we're here we're having a good time blah 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 um so it's a total change from any of that which i think makes it stronger Mm -hmm. in that that yeah, I feel like we haven't seen anything like this in Tokyo Joshi since like Su Young, maybe. Was she oh around? yeah, that Su Young is that's a good. When was she last in? It's been a while. But she also didn't. That was just sort of like ah, oh, she's very script like weird. Yeah. Do you um, remember when Saki was the zombie? teaming with oh, yeah, her i do remember that and was just had the most unsettling zombie walk i've ever seen in my life when i said how many what is the record of of sakis that we can because there's because i think that character was named saki that's saki all caps yes and there's also colors saki all caps yes <laughs> saki akai saki sama <laughs> I was like, how many people, how many Sakis can we uh, get in here? But yeah, I do remember. But that was very short. Wasn't that only like one? I think they only ever did her as that matches? character once. I think it might have been too scary. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like I said, very unlike, certainly curtain, current Tokyo yeah. Joshi. You know, there were some in the in the far past, but. Um, yeah, because if you go back and watch that footage, the way she staggers around the ring is genuinely upsetting. <laughs> I want her to be a zombie in a movie. The next match was the six-woman tag match. The team of Haruna Neko, Mahiro Kiryu, and Yuki Kamafuku defeating the team of Moka Miyamoto and the tag champion Saki Akai and Yuki Arai. In 12 minutes and 35 seconds. And I have the first of my decrees of this episode. Ooh. And my decree is, once again, I changed my mind on Mahiro Kiryu in this match. Because <laughs> I thought she looked good. She had a great spine buster near the end of the match. Um, and I have decreed. It, look, it certainly looks like she's moving into getting a tag uh, title shot. Yes. If... 
here, if she gets that tag title shot, if she looks good, I will determine that she is good and I will not change my mind. <laughs> and if she is bad, I will determine she is bad and I'm not changing my mind. She, there is no one else in all of wrestling that I watch and so frequently am like, well, I'm changing my mind again. Uh, she looked good. She looked, usually I'm like, oh, they're good. And they continue being good or maybe they get old and they get a little bit worse. Or I'm like, oh, this person is bad. And they're usually bad forever. <laughs> um, every time I'm like, well, now she's good. Um, so I decree that title shot will be the end point and I will make my final decision <laughs> on what I think of Mihira Kiri. All right. Uh I am I'm sticking with I don't know if she's good or bad. I don't think she was great in this match. I don't think anyone was really very good in this match. I I don't know. I thought it felt really long. There were parts of the match I did like, but overall it was just kind of meh to me. Yeah, it it did sort of feel like an opening match put in the not semi main spot because that was uh, the Tokyo Princess Cup, but it's sort of the last of the non vital matches, yeah. I guess I would say. And you know, you get Nako in there, you know, Mocha, who I think is good, but still is probably not at that level. Um, you know, shrug. I don't know. Yeah. I've come around on Nako and I think she's good at what she needs to do. Like, I don't think the goal is never for her to be a top level wrestler. I think she's out there to do cat stuff and take pins every now and then. And I think she's good at her job, but will never rise above where she is now. But to me, if that's her position, which I don't disagree with you in, what is she doing in the third match from the top on? Oh, yeah, no, she shouldn't be there. If she's not taking the pin, she shouldn't be there. (laughs) Like, that's sort of what I feel about, like, switch free Wi-Fi and the two of them, because I'm like, that probably would have been a lot better of a match. Yeah. And it just sort of feels like, why? I mean, Kiryu could have won this in the first match on the card. Yes. It isn't as if it's like, oh, it's a big, I mean, I guess maybe, but, you know, I don't know. Uh, Anyway. The the semi main event of the show was the first match in the Tokyo Princess Cup semifinals, which was Yuka Sakazaki defeating Suzume in eleven minutes and fifty six seconds. Kelly, what did you think of the first semi final match here? I thought this was great. Uh, just a fantastic performance from Suzume. Uh, the past two of her tournament matches really showed just how good she is. I loved how the entire match Yuka had the kind of feeling of why is it so hard to put this stupid girl away? Like, why is this taking me this long? I should be done with this by now. (laughs) And it was just like, ugh, I guess I'll have to work hard to win this match. Uh, It was really good. I went four stars on it. I also thought it was really good. Suzume continues to impress me. I mean, she may be. uh, I probably have to think about it. Um, maybe my favorite wrestler in Tokyo Joshi, if not easily, probably in the top three. Um, I just think she's great. And it's so shocking to me to think back, you know, some people have debuted and there's a sense of, oh, they could be really good. Um, Someone we'll talk about in a minute. It falls under that category. But Suzume, it's like sort of shocking as someone who, when they originally debuted, I was like, okay, this character is like, you know, sweet honey mustard, all that stuff, you know, dresses like a bee. I'm like, okay, this will be sort of an opening act. And now I'm like, she's really, really good. Uh, Sort of shockingly and continues. I, I feel like sometimes I go into these matches being like, oh, is this the match? You know, where I'll be like, oh, okay, she's sort of not as good as I always think. And she always is, uh, which is great. I agreed. I was slightly lower than you, but I went three and three quarters. Uh, so I thought this was a good match. And Yuka, of course, always very good. So a great semi-main there. And then the main event of the show, a, the second of the two Princess Cup semifinal matches, Miyu Watanabe upsetting 
Miyu Yamashita in 18 minutes and 23 seconds. Kelly, I will so generously let you go first. Okay. Uh, this was a war. I loved it. Uh, it was great. Like, Miyu was... Sorry, Watanabe. Here, I'll just use last names because uh, <laughs> it might be confusing. All right, so Watanabe, like, it was such a struggle for her to pull out the win here, and it was just such a fight. And I loved how she didn't really believe she won until her music hit, and then you see the, kind of the relief and just joy wash over her face. Like that was perfect. It was played so well. Uh, Yamashita just beat the ever-loving shit out of her with some absolutely brutal-looking kicks. This this was a fantastic main event. I went four and a half stars. Uh, what about you? Uh, we're pretty much right in line with this match. I said it had the feeling of someone like in an action movie where like the hero gets knocked off the edge of something and they're clinging on to the edge of a cliff or something yes. like by their fingertips and you're like they're gonna fall oh no they're gonna fall and like the person is standing above them being like uh, you know now you'll die whatever <laughs> uh, it just had the sense of someone barely surviving for like a long time um but just continuing to fight back it was really a truly sort of a favorite and an underdog you know, a lot of sort of underdog matches, people come in and they're like, oh, when you have an upset like this, would eventually sort of are wrestled 50-50 mm-hmm. just because of the way wrestling sort of works. And it never really felt like it did that. It always felt to me, even when Miyu won, which you talked about, she was so shocked at the end because it didn't feel like, oh, here comes Miyu. She's coming back. She's taking, you know, she's taking over the match. She's dominating you know, the tide has turned. It always sort of felt like she was on the back foot and trying to just survive, get a move in things like that. I mean, she took a beating in this match. Um, and I think that, you know, we talk a lot about how Tokyo Joshi, it's like, Oh, these wrestlers are getting better. You know, they're improving. They're very good you know, in this sort of promotion that's changing its identity. I mean, I think Miu is a genu- a genuinely excellent wrestler with no qualifiers. It's like, yep. she's very, very good. Uh, and she showed it here. I also went four and a half stars. Uh, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, it really felt like instead of being a 50-50 match, it was 75-25, but Watanabe just gave her all to that 25 and was able to pull out the win because of that. Well, and I think it's also a convincing to do that because Miu is sort of known for her strength. Yes. Where you think, okay, she could take a beating and then she's like, I'm going to do one strike and I'm very strong. And so it's going to really count. Yeah. And she's got all of her muscles as armor and stuff so she can take those kicks and it doesn't hurt her as bad as it would everyone else. Uh, But I thought a great cap to what I really thought was a great show. I mean, for me, I had three, uh, no, I had two matches at three and three quarters, a match at four stars and a match at four and a half. I mean, I would have to go back and look, but this might be maybe one for, uh, their January 4th show, but this might be the best or one of the best Korokins that Tokyo Joshi has had this year, and they've had a lot of them that have been very good. Yeah, it's up there for sure. But Tokyo Joshi was right back the next day on August 14th, back at Korokin Hall for the Tokyo Princess Cup Finals. But before we get to the finals, we start the opening match. Now Kakuta defeating Moka Miyamoto in seven minutes and 56 seconds. Kelly, what did you think of this opening match of night two? Uh, it was good. It was a solid opener. Uh, I really think Moka is starting to become more consistent in terms of quality. And I, I think this was a good matchup here. Uh, good three star opener. I wrote that I would rather have 
a match like this, a sing and by that I mean a singles match, then sort of opening the shows with these get everyone on the card matches because it's like, okay, we're now sort of this new company. And I think sometimes it's okay to be like, okay, not every single wrestler, you know, if you ended up doing, you know, two singles matches and two instead of two six person tag matches, you know, maybe it's like, that's okay. We don't need to get everyone on the card. You know, these yeah. are their sort of bigger shows. Now, of course, they have Wrestle Princess and the other sort of big, big shows, but it's like, maybe not everyone <laughs> needs to be on every one of these shows. Cause I thought that this was really good. And I thought it was a much stronger showcase of the company than just sort of these go out there, get your stuff in six person, eight person tag matches. Um, I didn't think the match was, you know, hugely special, but I think it shows some good sort of baseline wrestling and shows the improvement of the company and a lot of the wrestlers in the company. And I feel like matches like this are much better in helping wrestlers improve than your multi-man tags, just in terms of you, you get your reps in, whereas in the multi-man tags, it's, you're 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 not using the psychology you would in, as a singles match. Yeah, and I don't, you know, maybe the thought is just, you know, we want to get everyone on the card, or maybe it's with, you know, we want to give everyone the pay because if they're not on the card, they don't get paid or something like that. But I just think that this is as they sort of move into that, continue moving into the new world. I think this is just a lot. Uh, stronger of a showcase for Tokyo Joshi. Yeah, I totally agree. The next match, the team of Mihiro Kiryu and Yuki Kamafuku defeating the team of Hyper Masao and Kaya Torabami in 9 minutes and 49 seconds. Uh, this was just a match to me, clearly uh, more story focused in setting up uh, getting Yuki and Mihiro uh, solidified as a tag team and with the tag challenge, uh, tag team title challenge. So didn't really feel that strongly about it, sort of understood why they were doing it, but, you know, just sort of a match. Yeah, I don't really remember this one at all, and my notes just say, really don't have any thoughts on this one, two and a quarter stars. <laughs> All right, well, then we'll just move on to the next match, which was a six-person tag team match. The team of Haruna Neko, Miyu Yamashita, and Suzume defeating Mizuki, Palm Harajuku, and Raku in nine minutes and 27 seconds. Uh, Palm seemed happy to not be wrestling Max the Impaler again, <laughs> but then, of course, had to wrestle Miyu Yamashita and... Felt like a weekend of Palm Harajuku main character. Uh, <laughs> and once again, you know, really got the stuffing beat out of her at moments. And I was sort of rooting for her to win. So I think really two matches put together between the Max match and this match that really gave good shine to Palm Harajuku. Uh, I certainly left the weekend. I like Palm Harajuku before, but certainly left the weekend sort of more focused on her, especially in two matches that very easily she could have been lost in the shuffle in, or, you know, she could have gone out, just lost to Maxine Impaler, come out here, you know, just done a couple things and called it a weekend. And I thought that she looked great, uh, even in defeat two nights in a row. Yeah, I really think over... Over the past year, really, Palm has just become a more well-rounded wrestler as a whole. And I think she doesn't really get the, I guess, the praise she deserves because it's all really small stuff she's improved. It's not like, oh my god, she's out here having super in-ring classics. It's just like, she's oh no, she's just worked on her fundamentals. She's got her character stuff down and she's just kept at it and has set so gradually turned from this just undercard like kind of bad but fun enough wrestler to solid 
pretty much all the time to and also like can have those moments of like oh she's really good so i think a lot of people kind of just haven't noticed how much she's improved just because it's taken place so gradually but yeah i think she's at a really good spot right now uh, and this was a fun match yeah she's sort of in that group now of people who may not become super workers i don't know maybe they will but you know her raku is certainly the other big one that can still go out there and serve a purpose and have good matches even if those matches are not oh we're gonna go out and we're gonna have an in-ring classic you know and i think she that's what she showed this weekend was that, you know, I don't think either of these matches people in five years are going to be going, Oh gosh, remember that, the, that great weekend of Palm Harajuku, <laughs> but they were great matches. They were super enjoyable and that's another path. And I think that, you know, people, as we just talked about Haruna and Nako, you know, you don't have to be a super worker, but there is a level where you sort of, The work is good enough, but also you sort of really connect with your character. You know, Raku is really good at that um, and has a great connection with the audience that that's sort of another route that it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in the company has to go and have five star matches every show. But you can go out and really nail what you do well. And that is also very important. Yeah, the wrestling world needs lower mid carters you know it's and that's just where some people slot and that's fine as long as if they're doing a good job at what they do awesome that's that's what wrestling needs like not you know people say it not everyone's gonna main event wrestlemania it's like not everyone's gonna main event wrestle princess or whatever it's like you just you need people that are competent and good at their jobs to work the middle of the show The next match was another tag team match. The tag team champions in a non-title match, Saki Akai and Yuki Arai, defeating Ariso Endo and Hikari Noah in 11 minutes and 52 seconds. Kelly, what are your thoughts on this match? Uh, This made me think that I would like to see Endo team up with free Wi-Fi and for free Wi-Fi to become a trio. I I thought she and uh, Hikari were a good team. And I think they kind of just they vibe together well. So I would I would like that trio. Uh overall good match. I mean, Arai got her uh her win back after losing the previous night. It's a solid three and a quarter star match. Uh what do you think? Yeah, I thought it was a good match. The thing that stuck out to me most was Yuki Arai seems to very much enjoy uh the heel side of wrestling. Uh doing a little bit of underhanded things. So that makes me interesting, you know, tagging with Saki Akai, who is uh, very nice always, of course. Uh, But you never know, maybe there would be someone else in the world of Tokyo Joshi who, if she was really wanting to turn bad, uh, that she could. It just seemed like she enjoyed that. And I was like, oh, that would be interesting. I think certainly for now. Uh, Because she's sort of the draw, and with SKE48, I don't know that they would want her to. I wonder uh, if her rhino's French. Be be evil, but um, interesting to see. And I think, uh, you know, AA Cannon is an interesting team. I'm looking forward to seeing more of their matches, some uh, tag title defenses, to sort of see exactly what they have, because I think they're a, a very interesting team. The semi-main of this show was another tag team match. The tag team of Rika Tatsumi and Shoko Nakajima defeating the odd pairing of Max the Impaler and Yuki Aino. Kelly, I have a lot of thoughts about this match. I'll let you go first. Okay. Uh, I thought this was great. I really like they They made Max look like such a monster here. It was awesome all this stuff with max in it was was so good uh Aino pretty much did not need to be there uh she essentially could have just rolled in at the end to take the pin and that's about it because <laughs> i think you could have just made this a handicap match but then you would have had to have max take the pin and you don't want to do that so it's just kind of like i you know stand on the apron until we need you okay cool now's your time uh but yeah i thought it was a lot of fun to watch 
uh, Rika and Nakajima kind of try to figure out, like, okay, how the hell do we do this? <laughs> and then eventually pick up the win. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I went three and three quarter stars. Uh, what about you? Wow. Okay. Here we go. I hated this match. Really? Uh, yeah, I hated it. I thought that it was a win. So I didn't know. I, I went in not knowing what the card was. And I was obviously except for the main event. And I was like, well, we'll just see. And I was sort of watching and I was like, oh, there's been no Max, the Impaler match. I wonder what match they'll be in. Then this match sort of started and I was like, hmm, this is sort of a strange matchup. Why is she? Why are they tagging with Yuki? Um, and then I thought, oh, maybe the setup is that Max will win and they'll get a title shot against Shoko. That didn't happen. It just, to me, felt like you had such a great match the night before, like this special match. And then this match felt, it was like, oh, this is just like a a tag team match with someone who happens to be big. And they're doing some of the usual, like, oh, they're so big. Oh my gosh, that I've seen a million times. And I thought that some of it was, I was like, oh, there was this sort of aura after the first night around Max that sort of dissipated for me watching the match. I would have preferred, I also agree with you that I was like, why is Yuki Aino in this match? I thought Max should have just turned on Yuki, destroyed her and walked out. And that ended the match because that would have been another thing where it's like, oh, this is really interesting that it isn't just, oh, now she's another, now they're another wrestler on the roster. And, you know, they just happen to be big, which I thought sort of was, the end point of this match was they're big. Oh, that we've seen a million times. And so to me, I, I was just sort of bummed that I thought they could have done something else really fun and interesting with it. And they didn't. That's fair. I I don't know. I thought Max got in a lot of offense on Tetsumi and Nakajima to the point where it, they didn't win, but I think they came out of this match looking better than they did going in. Because now we see, like, oh, they can beat the shit out of people that aren't Pom. Yeah, I also just felt like... I I mean, I do think the Yuki thing was may, maybe my biggest issue. Because why is Max teaming with her? Yeah. Like, it didn't make sense where you have this character who's supposedly wild and, you know, out of control and doing all these things... And then they just sort of had a tag match with someone who they, you know, don't know. I don't know if there was some thing that happened in between shows that explained, oh, these two characters meeting and wanting to team. But that didn't seem like no. uh, a thing that would have happened. So I mean, I'm, I, I kind of always feel that way about Yuki Aino, you know, but that's just me. <laughs> but anyway, this was really my of both shows really my only big complaint is that I just sort of left the match thinking, uh, like lost opportunity. But the main event was the finals of the Tokyo princess cup. Yuka Sakazaki defeating Miyu Watanabe in 19 minutes and 36 seconds. Kelly, I'm sad to say my, um, my previous decree that I uh, that I was hopeful or something, whatever I said, <laughs> that I was hopeful that Wrestle Princess Three would end with one of a group of wrestlers winning the title is, unless there is a fluke, certain not to happen. Uh, but I have something to say about that, so I'll let you go first. Okay, uh, I think this is a match of the year candidate. I absolutely loved this. Uh, if Miu had won, I would have gone the full five. Uh, I ended up at four and three quarters on it. Uh, but I thought it was outstanding. Uh, I really loved how it felt like Yuka did not want to win this match. She wanted to be surpassed. She wanted someone to beat her and step up to this next level but she wasn't just going to lay down and let that happen. And it turned out Miu wasn't ready for that. So Yuka won. Uh, Yuka is the glass ceiling. 
and the glass ceiling did not break. So it was an incredibly bittersweet victory for Yuka. You saw her just as overcome with emotion as Miyu was. Uh, incredible. Like, I, just incredible performances from both women. Uh, I am still of the mind that Mizuki was going to win this tournament. And that is why Miyu didn't win here, because they don't want to elevate her yet. And they that spot is still for Mizuki at some point, and they really didn't know how to go about it, so just went back to Old Faithful Yuka. But yeah, I an incredible, incredible match. Uh, like I said, four and three quarter stars. If you have not seen this match yet, please go out of your way to check it out. It is very, very good. Uh, so yeah. what what are your thoughts? Yes, my amended decree is that I agree with you, and I think that Mizuki would have won this match. Yeah, I, I think she was going to win and then beat Shoko. Yes, I agree with that. And so for that reason, I am amending my decree. <laughs> I am pushing back the deadline and I will re-decree <laughs> that if some, if it isn't Mizuki, uh, Miyu, Maki Ido, who else was in that group that I said, if they don't win the title on January 4th, there's no hope. <laughs> It was Wrestle Princess 3, but I do think that they had to call an audible. So I will give them the benefit of the doubt in this scenario and say that January 4th is a new, you know, if Mizuki challenges on January 4th and wins, it's it's all good. Yeah, my uh, theory now is that Yuka beats Shoko and then Mizuki beats Yuka. Yes, and I think that now sort of has to happen because this is now the second Yuka Shoka match they've had in, well, by the time it happens in what, six months? Something like that, yeah. I don't know what the exact difference between the timeline between the two shows is. But uh, but anyway, on the match, I thought it was an excellent match. I actually thought that the uh, main event of the first night was slightly better, only slightly I went four and a half on this match as well. Um, this was really the match. I talked about it in the last match, but that really solidified Miu as an excellent wrestler uh, for me. So yes, I would say, I mean, I would say if you're going to check them out, I would check out all three matches, both semifinals and this finals match. Oh, for uh, sure. It's, it's only three matches. They're all very good. Um, and two excellent main events and two also, I think that Miyu, in a way, was elevated from oh, these two absolutely. matches. Um, you know, had a great weekend, had a lot of people talking uh, about these matches. So I think a win for them, even if it was not the original plan for this tournament, we will see. But really, this was a one match show in my mind, and I thought it was an excellent match. Mm -hmm. yeah Miyu comes away from this weekend a much bigger star than she was going in for sure the next show we're going to talk about is the stardom show from august 21st the stardom x stardom match from aichi prefectural gymnasium in nagoya Kelly, I'm really interested to hear what you thought of this show overall. Honestly, outside of the main event, I thought it was kind of a sleepy show. Like, just not much grabbed me about it. Like, I think there was solid stuff on it, but it wasn't a top-level show, and I have to wonder if the five-star happening around this match, or happening around this show is the reason for it because everyone's tired. <laughs> it to me felt a lot, a lot of my, or a main complaint I had in 2020 and some of 2021 was it felt like some of these stardom big shows were being put on because stardom was like, Hey, let's make money as opposed to, Hey, here's a bunch of matches we have that are big matches that justify being on a big show. This sort of felt like, 
well, we have the show. Let's put together some matches. Also badly hurt by something out of their control, which was that yeah. the semi-main, which arguably might have been the biggest match on the show from sort of a story purpose, had to be changed. Um, there's nothing really Stardom can do about that. But watching some of the show, I felt like, ah, Stardom was like, well could really use another $40 from some from the fan. You could save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, but when we just come out and say it, it feels like it falls a bit flat. So we're going to use humor. But we don't want to insult your intelligence, so nothing too goofy. And we need to avoid any polarizing topics. Oh, and it has to be about how you can save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive. You know what? Maybe humor is a bad idea. Yeah, it's never going to work. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. And so let's put together a show. It really feels like they just look at the calendar and like dates that are open for venues and they're like, we'd be crazy not to book it. Look how cheap it is. Yeah, and it feels like you have all these these five-star shows. People are into the five-star shows. They're watching them and it just, some of it just sort of feels like I don't know if overkill is the right word, but it just feels like we don't really need this show. We have something a lot of people are invested in in the five star. It just very strange to me. And then I think some of these matches went out and they didn't really have great matches. You know, if they came out and everyone way over delivered on all of these matches and all of a sudden you've got three, four and a half star matches, you probably can go, oh, okay, well, they went out and they did it anyway. It didn't feel like that here. No. Uh, but the show started the pre-show with the future of stardom title match. Hanan, the champion, making her ninth su- successful defense, I believe, defeating Miyu Amasaki in six minutes and 31 seconds. I wrote in my notes, messy, messy, messy. Uh, thought this was not a great match. Uh, you know, Miyu clearly has a lot of potential, but I think there were multiple moments in this match where I thought, ooh, that's a rookie. There were moves that were missed. She was in the wrong position. It just was. And we've seen from Hannon, obviously, defending this title over and over again, that she can go out and pretty consistently have solid matches. And it just felt like Miyu was not up to the challenge, you know, wrestling someone in a singles match. She's been wrestling on these new blood shows against the best wrestlers in the company, um, which is, you know, not to say wrestling is easy, but I think that's sort of the easiest version you can have as a rookie is going out and wrestling against the best wrestlers in the entire company. Here, Hannon, very good, but not on that level. And I think it showed that Miyu is not quite at the level yet. And I was also shocked that Hannon won again because uh, I literally have no idea who's going to beat her for this title. The unprecedented reign continues. Uh, she's at this point, she's got to relinquish the title. Like, but I she don't... might not. She might just keep it and keep defending it. I don't know. <laughs> that would be funny if like four years from now, she's still the future of Stardom champion. <laughs> They're like, you have to give this up. And she's like, no. <laughs> And she's also got the world of stardom title on the other arm. <laughs> uh, the one thing that Miu didn't hear that I really liked was her super like slick way of applying the calf cut cutter pretty early on in the match. Like she just kind of did that really seamlessly and rolled on and through. Like if she could bring that level of smoothness to everything else she's doing, she'd be awesome. Uh, but yeah, overall, not a great showing decent enough opener i guess the next match was a singles match micah defeating hina in five minutes and 40 seconds uh i have nothing to say about this match uh i'm just happy that micah's sunburn looks like it's starting to get better great the next match was a three-way tag team match (laughs) Uh, the God's Eye team of Amy Sore and Mirai defeating the Donna Del Mundo team of Julia and Mei Sakurai and the Oedo Tai team of Rina and Ruaka in eight minutes. Uh, this was 
pretty much purely a storyline match as Amy Sore and Mirai would later challenge for the tag title. So getting them a win low on the card. But other than that, uh, don't have much to say. This I have to say, these first three matches, I watched them and I was like, this is an ominous start for this show. Yeah, my notes for this match just say fine, two and a half stars. The next match was a Captain's Fall six-person tag team match. The Queen's Quest team of Azumi, Lady C, and Utami defeating the Stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Momokogo, and Saya Ida in eight minutes and 58 seconds. I thought this was a fun little match. I really liked the sequence between Azumi and Momokogo. They were out on the apron and then came back in. We're doing some pinning uh, combinations. I thought this was fun. You know, it's another one where they had some on the apron stuff. It was Captain's Falls rules. But I thought that this one didn't overstay its welcome. I thought that they went in, had sort of a solid match, and then got out some of the, you know, over-the-top rope matches, as I talked about a couple shows ago you know, can get a little long in the tooth. They go 15 minutes and you just sort of feel like, oh, okay, we get the point. But this one sort of came in, uh, you know, they did it and that was it. Yeah. Uh, I was incredibly confused by this match because I didn't know it was captain's fall. <laughs> so at first I'm like, oh, okay. Now it's, now it's a, it's an elimination match. Okay. This makes sense. And then not all of the members of one team got eliminated and the bell rang. And I was, very very confused as to what was happening (laughs) and then i realized like oh okay so saya was the cat okay this all makes sense all right uh but yeah overall fun enough match um i saw on twitter that momokogo is auditioning to play the role of mayu iwatani in the mayu movie do you think that this is her using the fielder method I hadn't even uh, I hadn't even thought of that. I was thinking it was a callback to the old time uh, costume change battle royal <laughs> that they used to do in Stardom, where people would come out in the, everyone's different gear, and they don't do it anymore. So they're just gonna bring it to the movie. Yeah. No, I think Momo wanted to play this role, so she joined Stardom and then worked her way into Stars to essentially stock Mayu to become her for the movie. That would be funny. You would think that other stardom people would be in the movie. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with the movie. You would think other stardom people would be in it anyway. You know, maybe not Momokogo, but yeah, I don't know. Like Kyrie might be in it. I would think. Right. I think we found season two of the rehearsal. Unless you cast everyone with actors, but I don't. It's gonna don't be know. weird to see a Joshi that isn't Mayu playing Mayu. <laughs> well, do we know she just auditioned? She didn't get it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She okay. just auditioned. But just imagining if she is in the role, like that would just be incredibly strange. They should just purely cast it with Joshi wrestlers playing not themselves. Yes. Uh. Nanai Takahashi as Yoshiko. <laughs> um, Kyrie as Lady C. <laughs> uh, but anyway, back to this very thrilling show. Uh, the next match was the Artist of Stardom title match. The Oedo Tai team of Momo Watanabe, Saki Kashima, and Starlight Kid retaining their title, at defeating the Cosmic Angels trio or I should say Cosmic Angels duo of Mina Shirakawa and Unagi Saika teaming with Saki. Not the zombie Saki, the <laughs> color Saki. <laughs> um, I have decided I'm not into this Momo Watanabe heel character. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I just, there's something about it that I'm like, no, uh, no, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. But I'm sort of like, ah, it's a, you know, when it first started, I'm like, okay, a fresh coat of paint. I don't know. It just feels like a not that important character. It just feels like a sort of reskin of Momo Watanabe. Um, 
who still is as unimportant as she was before she turned heel. Pretty much. Uh, I did like about this match that it was essentially just a Momo versus Mina singles match with their friends helping every now and then. And that that was fine, because I think those two have really good chemistry. And I, I liked their uh, five-star match a lot, and I like this. Uh, this match kind of brought me back into the show, where it was really losing me prior. <laughs> so I actually went three and three quarters on this. Wow. Uh, I thought it was a fine match. I think I probably would have gone three stars, but I was not. Uh, it was another one where I was slightly surprised by the outcome. I thought that Cosmic Angels had a chance to win. You know, the artist of stardom titles can sort of change whenever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought it was just another fine, fine match. The next match was our second title match. The Goddesses of Stardom titles changed hands after the Cosmic Angels, the new Cosmic Angels duo of Tom Nakano and Natsupoi defeated the long-reigning stars duo of FWC, Hazuki and Koguma in 15 minutes and 53 seconds. Good seeing Taichi at the show. Uh, Gotta shout him out, standing in the ring, looking like a weirdo. Oh, yeah, that's Uh, right. Despy was in the ring for the prior match. Yes. Um, Really loved Hazuki kicking the shit out of Natsupoi early in the match. Uh, I was sort of enjoying the match, and then Hazuki just blew the spot on the ropes uh, with the double stomp or whatever the the sledgehammer she was going to do to Natsupoi hung up in the ropes. And I was like, ooh. I was like, wow, I'm taking a, you know, some botches you're like, they happen at a spot in the match where you can sort of be like, okay, moving on. That to me, I don't know why. I don't know if I'm wrong about this. It felt like sort of a big spot. Like it felt like the beginning of the build to the finish. Like the match was going to start heating up and like moving. And it's like the first move and it's like air out of the balloon. That was such a bad botch to the point where I was like, wait, Maybe that was the intention. <laughs> like, was that supposed to happen? And I started to circle around, and by the time I'd stopped thinking about that, I was like, oh, I'm totally out of this match now. And I don't know if it was the miking. I don't know if it was the arena. I don't know what it was. This crowd fucking sucked. This crowd uh, sucked real bad. There were multiple moments in this match where I'm like, yeah, this is heating up, and there was no sound at all. In the, I'm like, if they would have had no crowd, yeah, it would have been the same amount of sound. And I'm like, wow, it's heating up. And then I'm hearing no sound, and I'm sort of like, mm, this is awkward. Um, I said, and I wrote in my notes, it probably would have been like a three and three quarters, four star match. You know, A, without the botch that really distracted me, but also with any sort of crowd. But it just felt... Light, like totally lifeless yeah i i don't know what happened like i feel like we have this conversation every couple of stardom shows where i so i don't it might be miking but they have a lot of bad crowds but like some of it i'm like okay this is the covid restrictions people can only clap you know but it's like you can't even hear claps <laughs> but this was worse than yes. that this was like no one was making any sound <laughs> It was yeah. like dead silent, except for then occasionally the people at ringside would yell. And I'm like, this is just nothing. Yeah, it, it's so strange. I don't get it. Uh, but um, yeah, I I don't know. This match, like, it was a disappointing end to this tag title run. I mean, I do think it was the right outcome. I think yeah. it was correct to change the titles. Yeah, but um, just the match wasn't what i would have hoped it was it was kind of just fine like i went three and a quarter on it and it's like that's a that's a solid enough match but not up to the standards of this team yeah it's certainly i was going to say on the low end of what we know fwc are capable of in these tag matches the semi-main event originally scheduled to be saya kamatani defending her wonder of stardom title against Kyrie, 
had to be changed a few days before the show. Kyrie uh, being pulled out of the show for poor physical condition. So Sayaka Matani calling out Himika to defend the title against. And Sayaka Matani successfully defending her title against Himika in 20 minutes and 20 seconds, 2020. Um, I thought that this was a fine match until the moment when uh, Himika decided to powerbomb <laughs> Saya off the top rope. That was insane. A move that when I first saw it, I thought, oh, they botched the move. I rewound and realized, oh, no, they didn't. That was that the move. intention. <laughs> and then they just went like nuts at the end. Yes. Like beating each other. Do it the poison rana uh finish. I was like, this is wild. I was like, this is crazy. So I ended up going four stars because like the ending of the match, I was so into like I was sort of like, this is fine, this is fine. And then I was so into the end of the match with the pot with the crazy power bomb, the lariat um Himika hit this crazy lariat at one point, the poison rana. I was like, this is wild. Yeah, it was, it got nuts by the end. I ended up going three and three quarters just because, like, I couldn't justify getting it over the four star hump because I, I thought the early, uh, most of the match was kind of just what I don't like about Saya matches. Uh, she replaced. Uh, doing her double apron bump in the early goings of the match with doing a double floor bump. So slightly changed it up this time. Uh, and then there was that extended forearm sequence that was kind of bad. It just kept going and kept going and kept going. But once they just lost their minds and decided to try and kill Saya, it, it was awesome. <laughs> And the main event of the show, the World of Stardom title match, the champion Shiri de- de- sex- uh, successfully defending her title against Nanaya Takahashi in 25 minutes and 24 seconds. My first note was, in all caps, this crowd is horrendous. Yes. Um, I thought it was a good match, but I felt myself weirdly not all that invested in it. The crowd was bad. I knew that Nanai wasn't going to win. She had like a 2% chance of winning. The crowd may as well have been cardboard cutouts. And they did a lot of cool stuff that I was like, oh, you know, the headbutts, the headbutt to the back of the head at the finish or near the finish that I was like, oh, this is really good. But I was just sitting there like, this is good, but I just sort of feel nothing except for thinking this is a good match. So I literally wrote in my notes four stars question mark <laughs> i don't know what did you think of it you said you at the uh, beginning you said you really liked it yes i thought the man was great uh it was the kind of just brutal war that i was hoping it would be it, i said in my notes it felt like the kind of match that by the end of it i want to take a nap because i feel so tired for both of them <laughs> like they just beat the hell out of each other those headbutts were crazy. I wish the crowd cared. Uh, I still went four and a half stars on it. I thought it was really good. They both worked extremely hard. And it's kind of crazy to see a start a main event where both of the people in it are like over 30. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Uh, you're totally right. Um, yeah. Like, uh, is Rossi but- just sitting there like, I don't know about this. <laughs> This is why the crowd's quiet. (laughs) I was thinking one of these times I'm going to introduce on the podcast and I'm going to call you the Rossi Ogawa of this podcast and you're, and that, that will be the end of it. Yeah. That's the end of the show at that point. You'll know it's the last episode of this podcast (laughs) when I come on and call Kelly the Rossi Ogawa of jumping bomb audio. (laughs) Cause I'm going to say something just awful after that. (laughs) Either that or it will just be silence. Cause I'll be sleeping. (laughs) Uh, uh, but anyway, that was the August 21st Stardom X Stardom show, but Stardom had a lot of other shows because they're in the midst of their five star Grand Prix. Uh, they had a show on the August 20th, which we will not be talking about because those matches are not up at this point, but through August 14th, the standings are as follows in the blue block. Hazuki, 
with a perfect 5-0 record, leads the block with 10 points. She has seven matches remaining, so she could still finish with a perfect record. Uh, doesn't seem likely, but certainly possible. Then down at six points each, Mirai, Saya Kamatani, and Momo Watanabe. A bunch of people at four, Mina Shirakawa, Natsupoi, Amy Sore, and Mayu Iwatani. Starlight Kid and Julia down on two points, and Suzu Suzuki, Hanan, and Saya Ida all with the goose egg, zero. Now, it is important to note that Suzu Suzuki has only had one of her matches. She has 11 matches left, so a lot of opportunities for points there. And her first two matches that had to be canceled still have not been confirmed if they were actually canceled or if they're being moved yet. Uh, correct. But so a shocking, any surprises in the blue block standings for you, Kelly? I'm kind of wondering if Hazuki might be winning. And that's why they had them lose the tag belts now. Because she's been having a really good tournament. See, I think what happens is now she won all these matches like, great, she's on this hot hot streak, she's feeling good. Oh, she lost the tag titles, and now she sort of crumbles. Yeah, you could go that way. And Julia sort of rises from the ashes um, to take the block. You know, because now she's got five wins, she's got ten points, she's doing fairly well. You know, she could win two or three more matches at most and still end up with a very good uh, point total and not win the block. Um, I mean, being in it with Julia, who seems like the odds on favorite to win the whole thing, sort of feels like it handcuffs it a little. Because you almost know that Julia has to get up there, near yeah. at least near the top. Um, you know, I think the red block is a little bit more open because it could really be anyone in that block, I think. Um, and speaking of the red block, the standings in the red block, Utami and Azumi on top with eight points, Himika and Tsuri on six, Risa Sarah, Koguma Saki, and Mei Sakurai at four. Tom Nakino, Micah, Unagi Saika, and Saki Kashima on two points. And Momokogo, 0 and 5, zero points. Kelly, what about this block? Are you seeing any potential winners start to appear in your mind? I don't know. I mean, maybe they just go chalk and have Utami win? It's it's hard. To, everyone's still pretty bunched up. Right yeah, it now. feels like we're moving into it. Everyone is still in contention, although Hanan and Momo Kogo are um, very close to being eliminated. But I have this feeling that, you know, Hazuki has sort of pulled away in the blue block, but could come back down to earth. I have a weird feeling it's going to be very bunched for a very long time. Yeah. Like it just sort of feels like one of those tournaments where it's, I mean, obviously this is what's going to happen, but I think it's going to come down to a lot of people very close to the end, Mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to like, Oh, it's between these three people. It's between these two people. I just think it's going to be very even. It seem it just I have a feeling watching the shows of it feels very sort of even Steven to me. Yeah, they're keeping everyone really close together where it's like okay, now you lose this one so that, <laughs> so you're not going above this. It, yeah. it's just it's going to come down to tiebreakers. Yes, and obviously I think very quickly I think by the time we record again I would assume Hannon will be out. I, oh, you know, sure. I think we're fine. I think we're going to lose sort of that first level of clear non-contenders. Um, but I think after that, it's just going to be like a war of attrition, especially in the red block where, you know, if the story in the blue block is Julia winning, I think we're going to start seeing that because she's just going to start winning and winning and winning. 
and that would be the sort of obvious thing to hook onto. But in the red block, it could be, you know, up and down and tied and, you know, moving here and there. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but the Stardom had three uh, five-star shows, one at Corican on August 11th, and then two shows, the 13th and the 14th of August. My recommendation, we won't go into all of these matches, but I would say check out the Corican Hall show, especially the second half of the Corican Hall show, I think is very strong. Not totally surprising. That's usually where they put on the strongest five-star shows every year and highlighted by a very good Mirai and Suzu Suzuki match, Suzu's first match of the tournament, and she impressed Kelly. Were there any matches from these three shows that really stuck out to you? Uh, Let's go over my notes. There is a lot of two, three-star matches on these shows. Uh, So on the Kurikin one, I really liked Azumi versus Tom. I went four stars on that one. Uh, also went four stars on Hazuki versus Poi or Natsu Poi. Uh, they both worked really hard in that match. Uh, Utami versus Risa Sarah I thought was good. I went three and three quarters on that one because the ending felt a little abrupt to me. And then Mirai versus Suzu was awesome. Uh, and that one was four and a quarter for me. Uh, let's look at the 13th. 13th didn't really have anything you need to see. Uh, 14th really didn't have anything you absolutely need to see either. I, I gotta be honest. I'm I'm getting tired of stardom. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot. I hate how they shoot their shows. I hate the, the pervert angles. I can't do it anymore. Like, guys, shoot your shows like a real big boy company. Like, get, get a hard cam. Because there, there's times where it's just like, okay, we have two shots of a pin. One of them is Daichi just laying in front of the camera, counting the pin. And the other is just a direct shot of Saya's crotch. What are we going to go with? I guess it's the crotch shot. All right. When really you could just have a hard cam and cut to that. You'd be fine. But like, And then the show on the 11th, why wasn't that streamed live? Why did we have to wait so many days to see the rest of it? Just stream that shit on YouTube because, you know, Stardom World can't stream on that because it's a website from 10 years ago. It's like you, you guys aren't going to lose any paying customers by putting this show out for free. You're probably just going to gain some from people who watch the show and thought, oh, this is great. I should subscribe. But instead, no. Got to wait all these days. I almost missed Mirai versus Suzu Suzuki. I didn't even realize that match happened. I thought Utami versus Risa Sarah was the main event because they're so slow in uploading the matches. So I didn't see Mirai versus Suzu until I had after already watched the shows on the 13th and 14th because I thought I was done with the show on the 11th. And like, I can't get mad at the people that work for Stardom because it's like, what, two people work on Stardom World? I mean, they have to have lives too, but it's just like, come on, guys. Run your shit like a real company. You want to be number two, act like it. Stop shooting from pervert angles. Well, Kelly, I have great news for you. The five-star Grand Prix only lasts another month and a half. God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they can... Look, you have a month and a half. Start shooting between the middle and the bottom rope rather than the bottom rope and the ring apron. I'm sick of upskirt shots. Sorry, Rossi. Kelly, I hate to tell you this, but this has been a complaint since the service launched. Like I know, eight and I years hate ago. it. I hate it. Nothing about their presentation has changed since then, and it's just like this is the exact same product as it was back then in terms of presentation, and it's ridiculous. You have a real like money company behind you too. I don't know why Bushi Road isn't working to make this like New Japan World. I don't know. Why, when they're doing their pay-per-views, it's on all these weird websites when you could probably get the functionality to have your pay-per-views just on New Japan World? That I don't understand at all. Like, why are we going to fucking festivalfoods.co.jp to watch shows when you could just be going to New Japan World? 
Like, what well, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? This I just keep watching these shows and getting madder because it's like you could be so much better than you are. You want to be the number two act like it. Come on. I'm watching fucking Kyushu Pro shows that look so much better than stardom shows. <laughs> that shouldn't be the case. Well, all right. Uh, that's our coverage of stuff. What do you think of the tournament, Taylor? <laughs> I said, I, you know, I've thought it's, you know, I think it's like <laughs> a lot of the five-star Grand, you know, I've seen a lot of five-star Grand Prix that, you know, you sort of have, once you sort of get past the first few days, you have the highs and lows and, you know, the Corican shows will be the highlights and you may get a, you know, one or two matches um, from the smaller shows, you know, maybe a match a show that really sticks out to you. But like I said, you know, the, the shooting angles has been a complaint since the first day that Stardom World launched on YouTube back when it was a YouTube subscription. Um, and I don't know, they just don't, you know, I think there's an element of, you know, Stardom knows best and they don't want to change. And, you know, if people are willing as I said a few minutes ago, if people are willing to shell out $45 or whatever it is in U S money, you know, every three weeks or two weeks to watch these pay-per-view shows, why as a company, am I even worrying about live streaming Corican? Yeah. People keep paying. I'm making more money that way. Anyway, this is why I can justify to myself, never paying for their pay-per-views. I will pirate the shit out of those until the day I die. Rossi, you want the money? Come get it. I'll fight him. I'll fight Rossi. Laying out the challenge right now. Rossi, meet me in the parking lot. I'll fly out to New York when you guys are over here. Yes, they are coming to New York on October 28th, and I will, uh, hopefully, I haven't bought the ticket yet because they're not on sale. I will hopefully be there. Uh, I just want to say I never pirate anything. I'm very clean. Uh... If this is played in a court of law, I am innocent. (laughs) Not me. (laughs) Anyway, uh, what else happened in the last two weeks of Joshi? Seedling had a show on August 17th. The big news there, the unfortunate news, Arisa Nakajima was treachered out in her main event match against Hiroyo Matsumoto. There was some thought it was... uh, head injury related but it seems like it is either leg or knee related i believe they're getting more tests or something like that so we should have news there but of course hoping arisa gets well soon whatever the injury is uh, oz academy had a corican hall show on the 21st headlined by akino defending the oz title against rini yamashita uh, Tokyo Joshi also had an event on August 21st. Uh, two big announcements there. Hikari Noah will be heading over to Pro Wrestling Eve to challenge Alex Windsor for the International Princess title. And Maxi Impaler will be making their return to Tokyo Joshi on Wrestle Princess 3. So exciting news there. Ice Ribbon had their tax pro wrestling show where Ram Kaichou and Saran became the new tax pro wrestling tag champions. That was a vacated belt um, beating Asai and Kaho Matsushita in the main event there. Diana had three shows on the 13th. Ayako, uh, Ayako Sato retained her Diana title over Krie. On the 14th, Jaguar Yokota retained the Queen Elizabeth title over Keoru Ito and Kyoko Inoue. And on the 15th, Haruka Umasaki and Miyuki Takase, the team of Luminous, retained their Diana tag titles over Kakaru Sekiguchi and Yu. Uh, Marvelous on August 8th had Keoru's retirement show. On that show, it was headlined by a four-on-five handicap match between the Marvelous team and the W Fix team, uh, a notorious group in Marvelous. Uh, but the big match on that show, Takumi Aroha retaining the AAAW title over Itsuki Aoki in the semi-main. And probably the biggest news 
uh, in all other Joshi in the last two weeks. The main event on the August 14th Wave 15th anniversary show, Hikaru Shida defeating Suzu Suzuki to become the new Regina DeWave champion. Kelly, is this a sign that Hikaru Shida is going is coming back to Japan full time? I don't know. I think it I think she's going to split her time more. I could definitely see her just being like, "Hey, I'm going to go live and work in Japan if you guys need me, call me." <laughs> but I'm not just going to sit in catering all this time. But like this match was so good. I loved this match. Uh this is my second four and three quarter star match of the year or not of the year of the show. Uh this was awesome. Suzu and Shida had great chemistry. Shida obviously hasn't had the opportunity for high level matches like this. So I was a little kind of worried that she wouldn't, that she's regressed in the States because we have, honestly, we have seen that uh, with her just not being as good as she was, but man, she stepped up here. This was awesome. And it was a good uh, youth versus experience match and the experience won out. But, uh, yeah, uh, what do you I, think? Do you think she's coming back? Is she staying in Japan? I don't know. It seems more and more like I think you could be right that she just goes to Japan and she says, if you need me, I'll fly over, you know, sort of the opposite of what she was doing, where she was mainly in AEW and would fly over to Japan. I think now she's going to be doing the opposite where I think she'll be in Japan. And if they decide they want her in the States, that she'll fly over for, you know, a little bit of time. But it clearly feels to me like the balance is shifting. It wouldn't surprise me if it came out, you know, I don't know what her contract situation is, but it wouldn't entirely surprise me if it came out that they just decide not to renew her and she goes back to Japan and that's it. Wouldn't be a total surprise. No, I should say for the match itself, I enjoyed the match, not, as much as you did, clearly four and three quarters. I went four stars. I thought it was very good. I thought it had a great finishing sequence, uh, but wasn't quite as high as you. But yes, I think it's clear. Uh, certainly feels to me like I'm sure Sheeta is glad to be back wrestling uh, competent wrestlers on a regular basis, <laughs> as opposed to uh, what she was doing in AEW. But Kelly... I mean, what? hey, maybe uh, maybe Coach Madison Rain will help her out when she gets back to the States. Really uh, really help her connect with the fans and become a better wrestler. Maybe she, uh, maybe she left AEW because she's a big Angelina Love fan and she wanted Angelina Love to become the coach of the uh, AEW women's division who said, boy, we need someone who will really help our wrestlers become better. They looked around, they looked around, they said, no, not Emi Sakura. We prefer Madison Rain. <laughs> One of the most who, puzzling decisions I've heard in my entire life. Who then joined the roster, immediately got a title match that was terrible. Had one of the worst matches that women's division has had on TV in a long, long time. <laughs> and that's uh, saying something. But yes, I couldn't blame Hikaru Shida if she wanted to, if she decided... Time to get out. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, what has been happening in Choco Pro in the last two weeks? Uh, really, the only thing of note is on Choco Pro 248 on uh, August 14th, they debuted a new trainee, and she had an exhibition match against Mesa Ruga. Uh, Mia is the name of the new trainee. Uh, we only saw her for three minutes, but I think she's got a ton of upside to her. She seemed like really sure of herself. And didn't kind of have the uh, the baby deer legs, you know, that you see a lot of young wrestlers have their first time out. She just felt sure. Uh, one thing I really liked about her is that her reactions to things felt more like kind of how a real person would react as opposed to like to being a wrestler. Just the, her facial expressions were just like she just looked like a regular person suddenly being thrust into being a wrestler. And it was very funny and i thought she did really well with that uh she's got a good size to her she's pretty tall uh 
overall, Mia is definitely someone to keep an eye on. Uh, I think she's got a ton of upside, and I'm hoping that we see more of her soon. Boy, speaking of Saki, all the Sakis, uh, now having a Miyu, uh, a Miyu, a Mia, a Mayu, a Maya, <laughs> that's, uh, that's going to be... Oh, speaking of Maya, uh, Maya Yuki coming to the States soon. Yes, and wrestling uh, Jungle Kiona in a match that should be uh, should be very good, and I wish was happening in New York or New Jersey instead of in North Carolina. Yeah. Do we think Yukihi will work dark? Mm. Well, she's not on the poster that or on the image. Yeah. So maybe I, maybe not. And I think if she, I'm going to say no, just because I think probably, I don't know why I think that, but uh, I don't know. It just feels like, oh, she's going to the stage. She'll probably want to be like, oh, this is my fun character. And I want to get the audience involved as opposed to. Oh, I, I think she, I, I, I actually meant, do you think she'll work AEW dark rather than the oh. dark character? <laughs> I thought you meant, is she going to work her Osaki goon? I mean, that um, would be pretty great. <laughs> character. Oh, that's so funny. No, of course I don't think she'll work dark. <laughs> and everyone will say, Tony, why didn't you bring this person in? Um, then next time she comes to the States, she'll um, lose a squash match on dark to Abaddon. Yep. Um, and that'll be it. Um, wow, that was a... <laughs> That was funny. I totally thought you were talking about her doing her Osaki Goon character. I realized that like, after a bit. I'm like, this is a weird answer to this question. And I was like, she doesn't really work the Osaki Goon <laughs> character in singles matches outside of Oz Academy a lot. <laughs> but no, I don't think she'll be. Uh, t- uh, don't get me. St- please. Don't no, get me I know. Started on. Tony will have access to great women's wrestlers and he will hire Madison Rain. Yeah. I mean, I'll also say Asuka is going to be in the States. I mean, Asuka just was in the States, but less said about that, the better. Yeah. Um, Ooh, Asuka had some fun interactions with Jun Akiyama on the <laughs> uh, DDT show from the 20th, where she teamed with Chris Brooks against Akiyama and uh, Saki Akai. <laughs> So if you ever want to see Jun Akiyama and Asuka face off, there's your match. Well, maybe they'll bring in Jun Akiyama into AEW and he'll say, Tony, you should hire Asuka. <laughs> and he'll be like, and he'll say, Jun, she's under contract to WWE. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, anyway, moving on. Uh, What's upcoming? Well, there's a lot of shows upcoming. Stardom has New Blood number four coming up on August 26th. The card, Lady C versus Chie Koshikawa versus Ruaka in a three-way match. Tomoka Inaba versus Hina. Mai Sakurai and Linda from Sinshu Pro will take on Saya Ida and Momo Kogo. Ram Kaichao and Rina will take on Wake Sukiyama and Momoko Hanazono. Please no blackface. No blackface. Uh, Starlight Kid and Haruka Umasaki will take on Amy Sore and Mirai. Hanan will take on Aoi. And Miyu Amasaki will main event in a singles match against Tom Nakano. My match of the night, easy pick for me, Starlight Kid and Haruka Umasaki against Amy Sore and Mirai. Yeah, that's a cool match. Uh, I also am excited for uh, Hanan versus Aoi. Or I don't know how to pronounce her name. I think that's right. Okay, because it's just three vowels. Yeah, uh, I'm also very excited to see Linda, just because I picture like a middle aged housewife. Nope, you're you couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> just a a real Karen coming in and being nope. Linda in all caps. Nope, Linda. Go on the- Go on the stardom web go on the stardom website and look at the images of the card and you will see that you uh are very wrong. Her finishing move is speaking to the manager. Stardom also has four five star grand prix shows on the twenty seventh, twenty eighth, and on September third and fourth. 
Seedling has a show on August 31st at Shinkiba First Ring. Tokyo Joshi has a show on August 27th. Then they have their next, another Korokin Hall show on August 28th, Go Girl 3, which is their all-women crowd shows. Uh, the card is Suzume May and Ariso Endo going up against Palm Harajuku and Haruna Neko. Now Kakuda and Mahiro Kiryu taking on Moka, Mita, Moka Miyamoto and Jirina Nagano. And then there are four Go Girl major single singles matches. The first, Hyper Masao against Raku, Maki Ito against Yuki Aeno, Saki Akai versus Hikari Noah, and Yuki Arai versus Yuki Kamafuku. And then the main event. Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling, the best special six-woman tag match. Shoko Nakajima, Rika Tatsumi, and Miyu Watanabe will take on Yuka Sakazaki, Mizuki, and Miyu Yamashita. So a fun card. Uh, Jury Nagano making an appearance. Uh, so should be, should be a fun show and an all-women's show. So it'll be interesting to see. I think their first all-women's show in Corrigan. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. And while then, you're running through that card, I looked up Linda. Uh, she looks very cool. Yes. Not and like, not at all what you described. Not at all what I thought. <laughs> not at all. Uh, and Tokyo Joshi has two shows on September 3rd and 4th. Sendai girls has a big show on September 3rd. The main event, Chihiro Hashimoto will defend her Sendai girls title against Ryo Mizunami, speaking of another AEW talent that got the heck out of Dodge. Uh, Ice Ribbon has a show on August 28th. Sayuri Ano will defend the Ice Infinity title against Micah Ozaki. Wave has their typical first of the month show on September the 1st. And Kelly, what is happening in Choco Pro in the next two weeks? On Chakra Pro, we have a show on the 24th, a special non-numbered episode. This is a special Chris Brooks birthday show. Uh, the only match on the show, uh, trios match, no time limit. Chris Brooks, Masahiro Takanashi, and Chie Koshikawa take on Mesa Yuko Miyamoto, and Osami Osa- Kodaka. So that should be a very fun match. Uh, that is the kind of match I would book if I <laughs> had a wrestling company in Japan. Uh, and then another match announced for their Phoenix Rises show on September 15th. Uh, this one is Chie teaming with Sayaka to take on Suzume and Irisu Endo. So that's cool to see that team in Choco Pro. And uh, Choco Pro working both sides of the divide here with Chie on New Blood and Tokyo Joshi talent on Phoenix Rises. Yeah, yeah that's kind of uh, crazy. So threading the needle there uh but that is everything coming up in the next two weeks next time we're with you i'm sure we'll talk about the go girl three at corican hall we'll talk about the five star grand prix as well probably new blood and much more so that is all kelly what do you have to say to close the show uh i watched predator 2 and it's very good predator 2 the one with uh danny glover Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I like that movie a lot. I like that movie more than the first one. And that one is, they're in LA, right? Yeah. And Gary Busey plays the other cop. That's all I remember. And I remember they're in some abandoned building and the predator is hunting them or something. Yeah, they're all, they like make everything cold so the predator can't see them. Oh, yeah, that's right. So are you making your way through the Predators? Yeah, now I'm all fired up about Predator after seeing Prey. So I I, I also watched uh, the original Alien vs. Predator, and that's a fun movie. I like that movie a lot. Uh, so next on my list is AVP2, which we'll see how that one is. I've heard not great things. Well, that's an exciting adventure. I have seen all the Predator movies, but I've never seen any of the Alien vs. Predator Films, Alien vs. Predator bad. is dumb as hell, but it's what you want it to be. Like, it's dumb in a fun way. Like, it, it, when you hear those two franchises fighting, this is what you want it to be. <laughs> well, there is your movie, or maybe movies, 
recommended for this week. Kelly, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, not really. I got all my rage out towards stardom. I challenged Rossi to a fight. Um, talking about good stuff I liked. Uh, I'm really happy that the uh, the rehearsal's coming back for season two and that we know it's going to be about the making of the Mayu Iwatani, Iwatani movie. Uh, that's that's all I got. You, you got any final closing thoughts? I don't have any final closing thoughts except to say thank you to everyone for listening. And for Kelly, I am Taylor, and we will talk to you again in two weeks. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. When you bundle your renters and auto insurance with Progressive, you could save money, but it doesn't cover any terrible memories living rent-free in your head. Hey, just wanted to remind you of that time your kicker missed the extra point and lost the game. Even though he literally never missed an extra point, he chose this playoff game to miss. Yeah, I just noticed you hadn't thought about that in a bit. Wouldn't want you to miss, you know, thinking about it. Sorry, we can't save you from that memory, but we could save you money bundling your renters and auto insurance with Progressive. Coverage from Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and third-party insurers. Renters insurance and bundle discount not available in all states or situations.